Okay, hello. Um, thank you for coming, those of you who are here. And thank you for watching, those of you who are watching the video. Um, right, so uh, unless, are there, are there any more questions about the first writing assignment that's due on Wednesday? I have a question. Yes. Um, how how are we supposed to submit it? Is it supposed to be a Microsoft Word document, or is it okay if we submit it as a PDF? PDF is fine. Okay. Thank Wait, you. hold on a second. No, I shouldn't say that because um, I'm not grading it. Uh, I think Microsoft Word would be better. I don't know if uh, Dexter has like to write comments on a PDF. You need not just the reader, but the Acrobat, whole Acrobat program. I don't want to assume he has that. So if you could hand it as a P, as a, a Word document, that would be better. But if you can't, I guess a PDF will work. OK, I'll just submit it as a Word doc just to be safe. That's probably, that's probably better. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Oh, wait, um, one more thing that. Uh, is there supposed to be a works cited page or do we not have to include it if we don't use any other sources? Well, for sure, if you don't include other sources, you don't have to, no. And even if you do include other sources, I mean, as long as they're cited when you use them. I don't think for a paper this uh, length that a, a bibliography is really necessary. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, okay. Um, so I'm just going to say a few things to introduce Locke. His um, dates are 1632 to 1697. So, um, right, just to put that in context, once again, the English Civil War was uh, 1642 to 1650. Uh, I guess there's different ways of counting where I remember, but I'll say 1651. Um, and the uh, restoration, right? But it's the end of the Commonwealth of England and bringing back uh, sort of the protectorate and bringing back Charles II was. 1660 and the glorious revolution when James the second right so Charles the second was the king after the restoration then his son James the second reigned for a while not very long and then there was the glorious revolution he was replaced by William and Mary um, that was 1688. Um, and uh, so the Locke's main works, uh, the, the treatises on government and the essay concerning human understanding were, the, the treatises were published in 1689 and the essay in 1690. So it was right after the, um, came back to England after the Glorious Revolution. I'll say in a minute why he had to leave England before the Glorious Revolution. Um, um, and I guess just to put this in context, so Hobbes dates are uh, 1588-1679. Leviathan was published, uh, I think right in 1651, towards the end of the war. So, um, so Locke was 19 years old when Leviathan was published. Um, and he was 28 when Hobbes died. Does that make sense? Hold on a second. I must have made some mistake there, right? 
is 40. Where did I get 28? It was 47 when Hobbes died. I don't know where I got 28. <laughs> anyway, um, so, uh, but nevertheless, the treatises and the essay were published uh, like 10 years after Hobbes died. <coughs> I'm confused how I got my, hold on a second. Oh, I see. What I did wrong. Yeah, Hobbes, Locke was 47 when Hobbes died, um, but the treatises and the essay were published even like 10 or 11 years after that. Um, so, uh, so we've moved somewhat forward in time, but I mean, they did overlap. As far as I know, they didn't actually directly exchange, you know, because even though they overlapped a lot, Locke's main philosophical works didn't come out until after Hobbes was dead. So um, uh, even though like some of Locke's teachers were uh, in debate with Hobbes, I don't think Locke was ever directly in debate with Hobbes. Um, So anyway, um, that's that's just to, to show how much we've moved forward or how little we've moved forward, depending on how you look at it. Um, as far as Locke's life, I don't have that much to say about it. But um, so, you know, early on, he studied medicine um, at Oxford. Um, and uh, he actually practiced medicine for a while. So that was like kind of his first career. Um, and uh, also while he was at Oxford, he was involved in this group of what were called experimental philosophers, but now we would call them scientists. Um, and that was especially like gathered around Boyle and Hook, um, now famous for Boyle's law and Hook's law <laughs> respectively. Um, um, but so after he left Oxford, um, and practiced for a while as a physician in London, he ended up working for the Earl of Shaftesbury. First he worked for him as a physician and then he worked for him as his secretary. The Earl of Shaftesbury was this, this uh, in this whole period was a very powerful and controversial figure. Um, and um, he uh, started off as kind of a favorite of Charles II. Um, and that was, you know, how he became so powerful. Uh, but in the years leading up to the Glorious Revolution, so um, that is like the end of Charles II's reign and then under James II, uh, the Earl of Shaftesbury switched over to the anti-royal party, the Whigs. Um, and uh, um, Locke, I, probably his sympathies would have been on that side anyway, but in any case, as an associate of Shaftesbury, he got like um, associated with various plots against the king and stuff. Like whether he was really involved in them or not, I think is not known, but um, that was why he had to flee England at some point, and he stayed in Holland until after the Glorious Revolution. Um, um, and so uh, the two treatises and the essay were, I think, people believe largely written before the revolution, you know, when he was in Holland, but they weren't published until after he came back. Um, and there's one other thing that is worth noting that has to do with his association with the Earl of Shaftesbury. So the Earl of Shaftesbury was one of the Lord's proprietor of the colony of Carolina or the kind of projected colony of Carolina. Uh, like when he became one of the Lord's 
for prior, it didn't really exist yet. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it was set up under Charles II. That's why it's called Carolina, named after Charles II. Um, and uh, that's why, because Shaftesbury was a, at the time was a favorite of the king. He became one of the Lord's proprietor of this new projected colony. And Locke, as his secretary, also ended up being secretary of um, the Board of Trade and Plantations of Carolina. So I guess plantation actually at that time means like a settlement, like a sell, like a settlement in the wild kind of where you replant it. <laughs> um, but um, so so he was like you know secretary for the Board of Trade and Agriculture of Carolina, which was like. Uh, I guess all Carolina was expected to do. So, um, so, and um, in that position, he, uh, I mean, his name isn't on the document, but it was widely assumed at the time, and I think is still widely assumed that these uh, um, fundamental constitutions of Carolina were mostly written by law. And this was at, this was so this was a long time before the revolution. It was like in the 1660s, I think, at some point. Um, um, so uh, you know, so because of that, uh, Locke became implicated in some of the um, in the like slave. African slave economy that was beginning to be set up there. Um, and there's one place that it's mentioned in the fundamental constitution. So that was part of the assigned reading, the most notorious, it's the, it's the only place actually that slavery or race are mentioned in the fundamental constitutions are the, are the part I gave you. Um, but he was also, uh, so I think you'll hear it said that he invested in the slave trade um, as I understand it, I, and I, like I'm no expert on this, so uh, you know, uh, this this could this could be wrong. But as I understand it, really, what happened is he was paid in shares of the Royal African Company, so he thereby became automatically an investor in the slave mm -hmm. trade. I don't think he held them very long, but you know, how long is too long? <laughs> um, so in any case. Um, that's something that I that I hope to like partly explore in this lecture, and that's part of the point of those re readings from the essay. Um, you know how that relates to Locke's settled views about topics like that um, at the time that he published the the two treatises on government. Um, Okay, I think that's uh... okay. So there's two questions that I missed while I was talking in the chat. So one is, would you say that Leviathan impacted Locke's treatise? Well, I'm going to talk about that, but the short answer is yes, <laughs> um, heavily. <laughs> uh, so. Um, um, you know, I'm going to be spending a lot of time talking about exactly where Locke disagrees with Hobbes. Hobbes. Now, I mean, the disagreements are fundamental, but they're localized. So, I mean, they, they, they make a huge difference, but Hobbes and Locke agree about a lot of things. Um, so that's one question here. And the second question is, did you say fundamental constitutions of Carolina? Def want to read that. Well, as I said, part of it is... <laughs> in the assigned reading. <laughs> so <laughs> you definitely can read it. There's a link to it from the syllabus, not to the whole thing. Though it's it's actually very bizarre. It was it was a very impractical constitution. It was never really put into practice. Um, it's uh, and although I believe that Locke wrote it, I think he wrote it very much at the instructions of the Lord's proprietors. Um, that it, it basically tries to set up a feudal system in Carolina, 
like complete with serfs and everything um, of a kind that that you know no longer existed in England at that time, uh, and moreover, like I guess, tries to fix it up so it'll be stable. Um, that's the basic thought behind most of it. Um, it's very very complicated, and but you know that's the main thing that's going on. Like I said, you know people are mostly interested in it now. I think because of the slavery and race angle, and it's just these very, this very short part that I put in the assigned reading where he actually talks about that. Um, and and I will mention what he says there. So. Um, so, I mean, it is kind of fun to read, but it's it's just weird. It's not mostly not connected to any real political system. <laughs> um, okay, so that's everything I wanted to say about Locke's life and so forth. Um, and now I'm just gonna start talking about um, the disagreement between Locke and Hobbes about the right of nature. Um, but there's going to be a detour in that discussion, as you'll see. So, um, um, because uh, they do have, um, uh, in some ways kind of subtle, but really, really fundamental disagreement about the right of nature. And from that, almost everything else follows. Um, however, and this is kind of a, um, all right, so Combs says in the chat, Lol, he tried to establish feudalism in America. That's tough. Yeah, but like I said, it was he tried to establish feudalism in America when feudalism had already like fallen apart in Britain. <laughs> he was trying to like reestablish it. But like I said, I think it was the Lord's proprietors of Carolina who had this idea that they were going to set up a new feudal aristocracy, of course, with themselves at the head. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, yeah, it's basically also, I shouldn't let myself get diverted by this, but it's basically the constitution of an independent uh, state. Like it, it doesn't, I mean, I guess it can be assumed that like foreign policy and whatever is under the direction of the king and parliament in London, but there's no like provision for appeal from the courts of Carolina to British courts, or I mean, it's pretty much like self-contained the way it's envisioned. Um, okay, sorry, so getting back to the right of nature. So, um, but the like the first complication here in, in getting at the difference is, and this has to do with Cohn's first question about how did Leviathan impact the treatise is that Locke isn't arguing directly against Hobbes. Um, in this book, rather, he's arguing with this other guy, Robert Filmer. So, um, So Filmer actually died in um, 1653, but his main work, which was the Patriarcha, was published posthumously in 1680. Right, so this is at a time when the like tension between the royalists and anti-royalists was heating up again in England, um, and it made a big splash. Um, and Locke, among other people, um, took it upon themselves to argue against it. 
So basically, Filmer's theory was that all po legitimate political power derives from God's grant of authority to Adam. Um, oh, that is that God made Adam like gave him dominion over his wife and children, I guess. Um, and so, like, if you wonder why reading Locke's second treatise on government rather than the first treatise on government, the first treatise on government is basically a like a detailed takedown of Filmer. <laughs> um, and there's like a um, summary of it at the beginning of the second treatise. So the right, so the first treatise is is like just trying destroying Filmer, and the second treatise is then Locke saying, and here's how I what I think you should say instead. Um, but he begins the second treatise by summarizing what he concluded in the first treatise, which is basically that number one, Adam wasn't given any dominion over anyone. Uh, number two, even if he had been, he couldn't have passed it down to his heirs. Number three. Even if he could have passed it down to his heirs, there was no saying who would be the rightful heir. Um, and number four, even if there were some way of determining the succession, since we don't know now who is the true heir of Adam, this is uh, um, the doctrine that that's the basis of all political legitimacy would be a doctrine that there is no political legit legitimacy, right? So it would basically, um, far from supporting absolute monarchy, it would support anarchy. Um, so like, um, um, that's a typical type of argument that Locke likes to make. Like your premise is, your first premise is wrong, but if and if it were right, your second premise is wrong. But even if they were both right, your conclusion is invalid, but even if your conclusion was invalid, it would be useless, <laughs> right? So like, that's the argument he makes against Filmer. Um, now, I mean, I have not read Filmer's Patriarcha. I guess I probably should read it someday, although I'm not looking forward to it. But I, I mean, I assume he's not quite as much of an idiot as Locke makes him out to be. Um, uh, he must have thought of some of these things, you know, but be that as it may, it's kind of unfortunate for us that that was the occasion of writing the second treatise, because in the second treatise, Locke goes on as if the main alternative to his view was Filmer. And, you know, even if he's not quite as silly as Locke um, makes him out to be, I think it's clear that his view is pretty silly. <laughs> um, so, uh, First of all, it's not that interesting to be, you know, to have Locke's view explained as superior to this relatively silly view. Um, number two, um, Hobbes's view is not silly and it's much closer to Locke's. As I was just saying, Hobbes and Locke actually agree about a lot of things. So it would be really helpful to have a detailed answer to, to Hobbes um, to explain exactly where he disagrees with him. That would be much more illuminating, but unfortunately that's, that's not what he wrote. So, I mean, uh, you could say, and uh, some people do say, well, you know what? The reason he didn't write a detailed answer to Hobbes is because he wasn't thinking about Hobbes, you know? You think that he has to be responding to Hobbes because Hobbes is famous now, but in those days, Filmer was the big thing and that's what he was thinking about. And like, all I can say to that is that I just, I don't believe it. I mean, I, I, I just, it's impossible to read this text without, for me, without thinking that he's constantly has Hobbes on his mind. Um, so without getting it, even getting into the historical question of how famous was Hobbes versus Filmer in 1689, I just, I think there's no question that there is a response to Hobbes here, but you just, you have to read between the lines to get it. Okay, so having all, said all that, um, as I said, somehow they disagree in a really fundamental way about the right of nature. Now they agree 
And I guess they disagree with Filmer about one thing, namely that the right of nature is equal in everyone. So, um, I'm going to do the thing I can do in Zoom lectures. I'll show you the text here. Right, so this is chapter two, section four on page eight. He's talking about the state of nature and Locke says, it's a state also of equality when, wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal, no one having more than another. So Hobbes agrees with that. I guess I should not have switched to this because I'm just gonna read more right away. Hobbes agrees with that. So the, the first question is, um, do they agree about why? And the second question is, um, given they agree that everyone's right is the same, do they agree on what that right is? And the answer to both of those is no. <laughs> um, so, um, so as to why, I mean, it's a little hard to figure out, but this is Locke's expla explanation on the, on the spot there being nothing more evident than that all the creatures of the same species and rank promiscuously born to all the same advantages of nature and the use of the same faculties should be equal one amongst another without subordination or subjection. And then he adds like, unless God like explicitly gives one of them dominion. But of course, that you know, that's not going to happen, right? So we don't have to worry about that. So, um, like you know, maybe it happened in the Bible, but it doesn't happen now. So we don't have to worry about that. So therefore, for all intents and purposes, in a state of nature, there's no reason why one person should be preferred to another. Um, now, I mean, on a certain way of understanding things, I guess that might still come out the same as Hobbes. It really depends what you mean by of the same species and rank. If you mean of the same power, then that would be the same as Hobbes, right? Because Hobbes agrees that uh, all people in the state of nature have equal rights because they all have equal power. Now, all equal power? No, of course not exactly equal, but equal enough. Meaning even the weakest has power sufficient to kill the strongest. So because they have equal enough power, Hobbes will say, and you could understand of the same species and rank as meaning that, um, they all have the same rights. So what does Locke mean by saying that all human beings are of the same species and rank? And it's basically because of that that I assigned um, a lot of that reading from the essay. Um, it also has to do with the race and slavery question, as you might imagine, those two things are related to each other. Right? In what respect are all human beings equal? And are some of them not equal? <laughs> right? So, um, um, and uh, Locke doesn't. Right, the, the essay, the second treatise is much shorter than Leviathan. It doesn't begin with a huge long description of human nature and um, so forth. But uh, if you want to know what Locke thinks about that, there's the essay concerning human understanding, which was published just one year later, um, which, you know, is much longer than the part of Leviathan about that, super long. And I mean, this is one of the main things that we read in, um, not all of, because it's too long, but one of the main things that we read in 
Phil 100C, the empiricists. But um, so, but for this course, I just wanted to look and I know I signed too much, uh, but I even made a note to myself not to assign too as much this year, but then I disregarded it. <laughs> but um, but it's really just a, a, a few sections to show what he thinks about the definition of human, or as of course he mostly says the definition of man. Um, so just as it's too much was too much to assign you to read, it's also too much for me to talk about it in detail. But uh, like a, a brief summary of it is that um, Locke, um, let me just write here, definition of human. This is kind of an interlude on the definition of human before we get back to the disagreement about the right of nature. Because again, it turns out that if we want to understand why Locke thinks there's an equal right of nature in everyone, in every human, we have to understand what is the relevant definition of human. Um, and in what respect are they are things that meet that definition equal? So, um, so basically, um, Locke rejects the view that you might call Essentialism, <laughs> which is um, a traditional, especially Aristotelian view. Now, I mean, I don't, Locke doesn't use the term essentialism. Again, I made a note to myself to look that up this year to find out when that word was first used, but it's not very important. Anyway, because it is a perfectly good word for this doctrine, whether it was used in the 17th century or not. So, the view here is that there are discrete essences. And by discrete, I mean that they don't merge into one, each other, one another, right? They're separated from each other. Aristotle in Metaphysics Eta says that uh, essences are like numbers. It's a little unclear what he means, but I think he means that they're like, um, like the only things that were called numbers then, the natural numbers, one, two, well, maybe not even one, depending on who you ask. But anyway, two, three, four, five, right? There's, there, there, aren't, there isn't anything else in between them. Each one has one that comes right after it. So I think when he gets to essences, it's not so much the order that he's talking about, although he probably does think there's kind of an order of them but it's the fact that they're, they're discrete. So, um, and every natural thing basically belongs to one of these essences, exemplifies it, has it. There's like huge debates among Aristotelians about what this relationship is and so forth, but it doesn't matter for our purposes. Um, and so, like, um, if you want to divide things into species, the right way to do it is to group together all the things that have the exact same essence. And then they differ in inessential or accidental respects. So one of these essences is supposed to be human. And another might be, say, like carrot. And another might be baboon. How do you spell baboon or baboon? Mm -hmm. Anyway, or the word lock uses here is drill, which I guess is actually still a name of a type of monkey, kind of like a baboon. Um, so, like, these are different essences, um, all human beings have this essence in common. They're obviously, they're not identical to each other. I mean, number there's more than one of them, first of all. And second of all, they you know aren't exactly similar. Some are taller, some are shorter. 
et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, but uh, they're all essentially identical, according to Aristotle. So that's why human beings belong together in one species. And for example, parrots belong in a different species. And these species don't, you know, there's nothing in between them. And there's no like borderline cases or whatever, because again, these essences are discrete. So everything either belongs under one or under another one. So Locke rejects this because he says, is this, I'm sorry, it looks like this picture has gotten fuzzy. Mm -hmm. Um, Locke rejects this because he says um, that, well, basically, first of all, there is no such thing as these essences. We had no reason to believe in them. Um, uh, but second of all, even if we, there were such things, we wouldn't know what they are. How would we tell by looking at two things, whether they have the identical essence or not? All we can tell is how similar they look to each other or not, right? Or how similar they are in various respects. Um, so for example, if you put, and these are the examples Flock is gonna talk about, So here's a rational human being. Rational meaning it uses language, it uh, anticipates consequences of actions, which is important because that means it can understand punishment and reward. Um, maybe some more things as I'll say, but anyway, this, so this is a rational human being. It does all those things and it also has a certain shape. Right? It, it walks on two legs, it doesn't have feathers. Um, that's an old definition of human being, featherless biped. <laughs> um, supposedly, this story is um, almost certainly not true, but it's an ancient story about Plato and Diogenes the Cynic. I don't know why I say it's certainly not true. There's almost certainly no reason to believe it's true. Could be true, I guess. Anyway, that one day Plato is like lecturing and saying that, uh, giving this definition of human being as featherless biped and Diogenes the cynic holds up a plucked chicken and says, this is Plato's man, <laughs> right? So, um, and then like supposedly, uh, Plato tried to fix the definition by adding that it has to have flat toenails. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, uh, but most people took from the moral of that story to be that this wasn't a good definition. But I mean, it does apply to, the, to this thing here, this rational human being. Now here's another thing that has exactly or more or less the same shape as this one. It's also a featherless biped, but it's lived 40 years and never shown any of the marks of reason as Locke puts it, right? So we're talking about someone with a severe cognitive disability. Um, and Locke sometimes calls these people idiots and sometimes calls them changelings. So, I mean, idiot, I, I think that idiot, it's like, it's like a Greek term, right? I think it's, it started off sounding kind of clinical, um, but then as these words have a tendency to do, you know, by now it's become obviously very derogatory. I don't think Locke means it that way, but anyway, and changeling as a kind of euphemism, 
I've still never looked into the details of why, but I, I think it's like derives from some superstition that they're changed in the cradle by fairies or something. But, but the people who use it don't, they don't actually believe that this, that's how it happens. They just, it's just a euphemism, right? So one of these people, idiots or changelings or whatever, And now here's another thing. So I'm gonna indicate that this, this guy is rational. This one here is rational by having to say something. Okay, so since they use language, they, they know, we know they're rational. Well, since they use it correctly, they answer and respond reasonably. Right, so this other thing here is, um a small green actually maybe in the story it's a big one i don't know it's a big red feathered bird and it shows the marks of reason so it's a rational parrot Now, are there really such things? Well, uh, Locke tells this story, you know, that someone heard from their friend about Prince Maurice, how Prince Maurice claimed to have uh, had a conversation with a rational parrot. And Locke's, you know, doesn't, I don't think he's sure that the story is true, but it doesn't really have to be true. He just wants you to admit that it's not inconceivable. When you hear the story, you're not like, well, no, that's a contradiction in terms, right? It's possible such a thing should happen. So this is at least a possible thing. And then here's one more thing, which is this drill. I totally don't know how to draw, but you know, it's probably got a big red butt like a baboon and the tail and red. I don't know. It's not a very good. <laughs> It's more like a goat. Uh, I don't know. Um, anyway, it's like it doesn't have feathers. It's not rational, uh, and it doesn't walk on two legs. So, like, which of these things are the same kind of thing, and which are different kinds of things? So, like, an Aristotelian would say. Um, well, these two are the same kind of things because they have the same essence, the essence of human. And this one and this one are, are two other kinds of things because they have two other essences, the essence of parrot and the essence of drill. But Locke says, we don't know anything about these essences. And even if we, um, well, sorry, we, we don't have any reason to believe there are such essences. And even if we did, we wouldn't know what they are. Um, all we can do is classify things by how they appear to us. And if you do that, well, it, you know, it depends. Like, if you classify things by shape, then you're going to put these two together. They're both featherless bipeds. And these two will not be in that species. On the other hand, you could classify them by whether they're bipeds or not. So in that case, these three will be the same species and this one will be out. Or you could classify them based on whether they have feathers or not. So in that case, this is gonna be the only member of the species that has feathers and these two will be out. Or you could classify them based on whether they're rational or not. And in that case, these two will be the same species. And these two will be out. So why do we even think that there are species of things, according to Locke? You can just divide them however you want. And Locke's answer in the essay is that um, although things don't have and or we don't know there are uh, real essence, um, they do have a nominal essence. Yeah, 
if you have a nominal essence, and the nominal essence is basically the definition of the word we're using to name them. So all the things to which the same word applies have the same nominal essence, namely the definition of that word. Now, this means obviously, you know, for one thing, it's not going to be like species are going to overlap each other, right? Because we might have word, one word that collects things together one way and another word that collects things together in another, in a different way that they overlap. Um, um, uh, but it also means that uh in agreement with Hobbes, Locke is saying a lot might depend on how you define your terms. The way we divide things in the world into species is going to depend on how we define our, our nouns, our, our general names. Um, So with that, you know, and I think um, in the reading, the part that was probably hardest to understand was the part where he's talking about that. I don't know, maybe I should have just tried to explain that myself and not assigned it. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so, uh, so, so, so then when we go back to the question, definition of human, we can see, um, that the question is going to be kind of like one of Hobbes's questions about propriety of speech. What's the good way to define this word for certain purposes? And I mean, so the main contenders are still Plato's definition, basically, featherless biped, add in some more details. Um, Thoreau mentioned someone who thought it was important that the chicken knees don't bend the, or bird knees don't bend the right way. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so adding some more details, but basically featherless biped, um, that is we classify uh, things as human or not based on their shape. Or the other thing, so like I said, most people took the moral of that story to be that featherless biped is not the correct definition of a human being. And what did they think was the correct definition? Well, rational animal. So, um, so, so those are still the main contenders, but um, we're not, when we ask that, we're not asking what things are part of this, really part of this essence that makes all human beings identical. We're asking what's the right way to group things together and call them human beings for some purpose. Are there questions about any of that so far? I have, a, I have one, yes. Okay. Um, it's mainly about this last distinction or not like two, two contenders like uh, federalized bipeds or rational animal. So rational animal is like, was used by Aristotle, right? So- Aristotle we, uses both in different places. <laughs> right, but if, if he uses it, doesn't he fall back into essentialism or he uses it in a very distinctive way? So because he admits that the parrot is a rational well, Aristotle his... doesn't discuss the case of a rational parrot, right? And I think actually, if you asked Aristotle, Aristotle would say it's impossible. Right. If you said we heard a story about it, Aristotle would say it couldn't be. I think, but I'm not sure. You know, it's hard to know. Aristotle yeah. is very difficult to interpret. Like I said, he gives both of these definitions. <laughs> um, and especially hard to know what he would say if you told him a story that he never actually heard, right? So, I mean, yeah. Um, but, uh, but I think like, uh, Locke in arguing with someone who wanted to defend something like Aristotle's view now could bring the rational parrot and say, what do you say about this? Um, but I'm not sure. Did you have, it sounded like you had more question than I addressed. 
Well, no, that, that was it. It's like if I was looking at this rational animal uh, thing as more of a Aristotelian view, because I feel like it's like overused today, maybe even in politics and, and some, well, yeah, mainly in politics, I think, and yeah. political uh, um, courses. And so I was just thinking that if he uses this expression, then he must use some of the Aristotelian uh, tools around it because he oh, used oh, a lot wow. of this. Yeah. Oh, well. Um, you know, I think that's why Locke emphasizes and why I so emphasize when I was summarizing him, like bears the marks of reason. When when he said when Locke says something is a rational animal, he's not claiming to know something about um, either about its true internal properties, which he agrees it has, but he says we don't know, right? Like its microscopic structure or whatever. Yeah. Um, or about the supposed like essence that it has. He's he's just talking about the way it acts. Yeah. Yeah, because after all, with luck, it all comes down to to the ideas, right? Even if, even when we want to categorize species, the only way we can do it is based upon the ideas we get from the senses, and then work with yes. those. Yes, I mean, with possibly some exceptions, but um, yeah. yeah. So, um, um. And you know, like some of the exceptions have to do with geometry and physics, but maybe some of them have to do with ethics also. Anyway, like if you want to hear a lot about that, uh, actually, I don't know. Am I teaching 100C next year? I might not be for the first time in a while. I don't remember. No, maybe I am in the winter or something. I don't know. Anyway, if you want to hear a lot about that, you could always take 100C with me, but I don't have time to get into it now because... Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, so I'm just saying, like, those, those are the two main contenders, and, the, and this is really the confusing part. In book one of the essay, without getting into the details, it, it sounds as if the right definition according to Locke, is going to be the featherless biped one. It's going to be the one that includes changelings, as well as someone else I didn't draw here, but is important. Children who haven't reached the days of reason. Um, it's, it sounds in book one like the right definition is going to be this. And so it's going to exclude the rational parent. And actually, in a lot of other places in the essay, he seems to be heading towards that conclusion. Um, for example, when he cites that story of Prince Maurice, the reason he's citing it is because he he wants to say now when when you when you hear this when someone tells this story or when you like summarize this story, what do you call this creature? Do you call it? a small feathery human being, or do you call it a rational parrot? And the answer is we call it a rational parrot. So Locke says, well, so obviously your definition of human being is not rational animal. Right, so, he, so, so he's arguing, you know, I mean, I think, um, he certainly argues throughout most of the book that the way we usually use the term human or man is to mean uh, you know, something of a certain shape, not rational animal. But in book one, it also sounds like he's drawing conclusions from ethics about that. But then all of a sudden in book four, he seems to say the opposite. So, um, this is book four, chapter four, section 13.
Not readable, pretty small. It would possibly be thought a bold paradox, if not a very dangerous falsehood, right? So he's about to say something that people in his time find shocking and offensive. And I guess it's fair to say that we also find it shocking and offensive. Maybe not for exactly the same reason, or maybe for exactly the same reason, I don't know. But anyway, he's, he, nevertheless, he knows you're gonna be offended by this, but he says it anyway. It would pass, uh, if I should say that some changelings who have lived 40 years together without any appearance of reason are something between a man and a beast. Which prejudice is founded upon nothing else but a false supposition that these two names, man and beast, stand for distinct species so set out by real essences that there can come no other species between them. So fine, no real essences, but where is he drawing the line now? So he said this changeling that has lived 40 years without showing any trace of reason, there's something between a man and a beast, meaning that the species human is not going to include them. So it seems like all of a sudden in book four, he's changed to favoring the other definition, rational animal. Now, um, why does that happen? So I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, but I think the answer is, so in book one, the context I was talking about is his argument that there are no innate practical principles, right? So Locke famously is the proponent of the tabula rasa view, although actually that metaphor also comes from Aristotle. <laughs> um, but uh, Locke is, is famously the proponent of the tabula rasa view that we're not bo born knowing anything. Um, neither, well, maybe except for some vague things like I'm hungry now, or, you know, it's warm or whatever. Um, but we're not born in knowing any principles upon which you could build sciences or build the structure of ethics. Um, we have to find them out by experience and by reasoning. So in book one, he's arguing against the people who believe that there are innate principles. And when he comes to the argument that there are, well, actually, I mean, this works for both practical principles and theoretical principles. Um, he says, uh, um, if they were really innate, Everyone should know them, but children and changelings don't know them. Therefore, they're not innate. And that's why I say his argument seems to presuppose that this is the boundary of the species human, right? If these are innate to humans, then we expect all humans to know them including the changeling and the child who's not yet reached the age of reason. And of course, changelings and children who haven't yet reached the age of reason don't know the law of contradiction or the various supposed theoretical principles. And uh, well, I mean, Locke says it's clear from the way they act that uh, there's plenty of uh, apparently rational adults who don't know practical principles. <laughs> um, so, but in any case, um, why is he used that definition there? Well, I think it's like, I mean, suppose there were innate principles, who would you expect to be born with them? Like what animals? 
And I think the answer is like, it's hard to say. It could be, I mean, who knows what animals could be born within what innate principles. But according to his opponents, the answer is human beings. And by that, they mean featherless bipeds, basically. So I think, you know, like Locke is using their position against them. Whereas in book four, he's going with his own opinion. So his own opinion is that we, lear we learn practical principles by reasoning. So like on the next page, he considers an objection. This is why people will be so offended or one of the reasons anyway. Um, well, actually, let me, let me not switch yet. One of the reasons people are going to be so offended, he says, when, you know, when he says that changelings are not human beings, they're going to be offended because they're going to say, what, do you mean they don't have an immortal soul? They, you know, they won't, uh, um, ha they have no afterlife. How can you say that? So Locke says, uh, I don't know if they'll have an afterlife. That's up to God, not, not up to me. <laughs> um, but he says, um, uh, you know, uh, but what I do know is, and this is the part I want to read. It may suffice us, right? So he's just said, like, it's not our business to know what kind of afterlife God gives to different creatures or whatever. It may suffice us, us that he hath made known to all those who are capable of instruction, discourse, and reasoning, that they shall come to an account and receive according to what they have done in this body. Right, so what he's saying there, and he's saying it in the, in the context of like, who can we be sure has an afterlife, but um, it clearly has more implications than that. He's saying that like, for the people who we know are definitely subject to divine reward and punishment, um, are the people who are subject to any kind of reward and punishment, namely, um, people who can understand reward and punishment. That is rational creatures. Um, because again, we don't learn what we should do and what we shouldn't do by having innate practical principles. We learn it by reasoning from the consequences of different kinds of actions. So that's, I think, is why in book four, um, he switches to a definition that um, doesn't include the child yet, includes the rational adult, excludes the changeling, and implicitly includes the parrot, right? I mean, the parrot can reason the same way we can by hypothesis. So if we can conclude that we're subject to divine reward and punishment, so can the parrot. Um, okay, so that's kind of the end of this interlude with stuff from the essay, except to just draw the consequence from that, which is that when Locke says that we're all of equal rank and species, um, he, presumably is using that rational creature definition here. Right, I mean, a rational parrot could be a member of a commonwealth. It could enter into our covenant with us. We'll see, you know, Locke has certain disagreements with Hobbes about how that works, but that's still gonna be essential according to him. The parrot can do that. Right, so a, a, you know, a parrot is like subject 
a rational parrot, I think Hobbes also would agree with us. A rational parrot is subject to the laws of nature the same way we are. So, um, um, but it seems like, uh, um, I mean, of course, for Hobbes, that's important, but it's not the basis of the equality of right. Um, for Locke, I think um, that's the definition of the type of things that are going to be equal, and the respect in which they're equal is that they're equally rational. Um, e exactly equally rational? Well, no, again, just like Hobbes had to admit that we're not all exactly equally power, equally powerful, but rational enough. Um, okay, so that basis is different from Hobbes, but it's not clear yet what difference it's going to make to the right of nature. Um, but I think it does lead to the big difference about the right of nature, if you think about it right. So the big difference about the right of nature, remember I said there were two things. So Locke and Hobbes agree that the right is equal in everyone in a state of nature. But the question is, is it for the same reason? And do they agree about the extent of the right that everyone has? And I said, the answer to both is no. So I just tried to, uh, maybe not as well as I could, but I mean, I could cite other stuff, but I don't have time, but I, I, I just tried to, um, to show that the answer to the first one is no. The answer to the second one is definitely no. This is how um, Locke describes the state of nature. This is um, back in the second treatise. Um, Chapter two, section four. So by the way, um, in case it's not clear, the section numbers are numbered um, continuously throughout the book, right? Not They don't start over at each chapter. So like the first section of chapter two is section four. All right, because the last check section of chapter one is section two. Okay, anyway, so this is how he describes the state of nature a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions. So right, by the way, dispose of their possessions, right away we can see that we're not in Hobbes state of nature. In Hobbes state of nature, there are no possessions. But anyway, dispose of their possessions and, pos and persons as they see fit within the bounds of the law of nature without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. So remember, according to Hobbes, the equal right that we all have in the state of nature is an unlimited right to everything. According to Locke, the state, in the state of nature, our right is limited by the law of nature within the bounds of the law of nature. So let me, you know, which one is uh, it's not the of nature. So according to Hobbes, in the state of nature, everyone has the right to everything, including other people's bodies. So this person has the right to this person's body, but it is equal. This person has the right to this person's body. Everyone has the right to everything. According to law, my right in the state of nature is limited. And it's limited by the law of nature. Now, I mean, remember, Hobbes also says that, um, so there's at least a chance that it won't interfere with your life.
Now, I mean, remember, Hobbes uh, agrees that the law, law, law of nature or laws of nature um, apply also in the state of nature, but he says they apply only in foro interno, which means that they only regulate my um, desires, but not my actions. But um, Locke in saying that the law of nature bounds my right in the state of nature is saying that somehow or other, it limits my freedom to act, not just my freedom to wish. So this is a very important difference, obviously. And like I said, almost everything else is gonna, that's different between them is gonna follow from this. Um, are there questions about that so far? No, that's not. So this limitation is not minor, in fact. If you look on the next page in section six, there's two parts of it that Locke states. Though man in that state have an uncontrollable liberty to dispose of his person or possessions, yet he has not liberty to destroy himself or so much as any creature in his possession, but where some nobler use than its rare preservation calls for it. Right, so this is related to something we're gonna see turns out to be important in Locke's theory of the origin of property. Um, that Locke thinks in the state of nature, I, I don't have a right to destroy things wastefully even if they're mine. Um, so not only don't I have a light, right to kill myself, but I don't even have a right to like um, kill animals or even like let acorns spoil in my possession. <laughs> um, unless it's for a good reason. So presumably he thinks like eating is a good reason. So, right, I mean, he's, he's not advocating vegetarianism here. Um, but if you were to just destroy an animal for no reason, uh, even if it was yours, that would be a violation of the law of nature. So that's a pretty strong constraint. And then there's this other constraint Um, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. Well, that's the end. No one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. For men being all the workmanship of one omnipotent and infinitely wise maker, all the servants of one sovereign master sent into the world by his order and about his business, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't read the rest of that. The important part is this, being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. So um, that's saying basically that this picture I drew here is right. In the state of nature, my right is bounded before it interferes with your right. right. So these overlapping rights that give rise to the state of war in Hobbes' state of nature don't exist in Locke's state of nature. Because not only does the law of nature constrain how I can use my property, but it absolutely prevents me from interfering with your property including your possessions, but also more importantly, including your life, health, and liberty.
Um, so clearly this means that, um, well, it's, I mean, it's clear if you add that Locke agrees with Hobbes about something else, namely that our will is always determined by the desire to obtain pleasure and escape pain. Um, and uh, um, part of the reading I gave you from the essay also addresses that. So given that he agrees with Hobbes about that, it means he must think there's some artificial chains, only I guess they're not artificial, but <laughs> right, some like invisible chains in the state of nature that um, cause me to realize there will be bad consequences from violating your right. Because otherwise, as Locke says in the essay, it would be vain for one intelligent creature to prescribe a rule to another unless it were in their power to, you know, um, give them rewards or punishments. Like I can tell you do X, Y, and Z, but again, he agrees with Hobbes that you're always going to do whatever you think conduces to your own pleasure or uh, helps avoid your own pain. So my command is worthless as a command. It might be worthwhile as advice, but it's worthless as a command unless I can attach bad consequences to violating it insofar as it's my command. That's a punishment. So there must be some kind of reward and punishment system going on in the state of nature that will make people observe this law. Um, now, I mean, I'm going to say something in a moment about what that constraint is, but I just want to, before I say that, or, you know, what the, what the executive is in the law of nature, according to Locke, because it turns out to be a tough question, right? The executive is whoever um, doles out rewards and punishments based on the law. According to Hobbes, the executive is the sovereign, the same person who makes the law. But according to Locke and Rousseau and a lot of other people, um, it's at least a bad idea and perhaps even impossible for the executive to be the same as the legislative, legislative power. Um, so, um, so the question is, the question is going to be, who's the executive in the state of nature, according to Locke? But like I said, before I get to that, I want to point out that this difference um, between Hobbes and Locke leads to a fundament fundamental difference in the definition of liberty. Now, um, now, I mean, uh, this isn't part of the reading I gave you from the essay, but in the essay, Locke agrees with Hobbes that liberty, strictly speaking, means like physical liberty, right? The ability to do or forbear something based on my preference. Um, so, right, I'm at liberty if I'm not literally in chains or if there's not literally a wall or whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, as Hobbes points out, when we talk about liberty of subjects in a commonwealth or liberty of humans in a state of nature, we're obviously not talking about that kind of literal liberty because people for the most part have that. Right? Like I'm at liberty to break the law. Nothing's physically stopping me from doing it. Um, rather, we're talking about this metaphorical sense of liberty. Um, and then the question is, what is the metaphorical sense of liberty? So according to Hobbes, the sense in which the subjects can be said to have liberty 
is that um, these artificial chains restrain them from doing lots of things, right? So they're physically, literally, in a proper sense, at liberty to break the law. But in this metaphorical sense, they're not at liberty to break the law because if they break it, they'll be punished. Or at least they have a serious fear they'll be punished. It's a credible threat, right? So, um, um, so what is constitutes the liberty of subjects according to Hobbes? And if you recall, he defines it as basically whatever the law leaves over. So if there's no law telling me to do or not do something, then I'm still at liberty to do it, even in the civil state. And in the law, of, in the state of nature, in Hobbes' state of nature, where there's no law at all, no law that binds in foro externo, um, that is no law at all that regulates my actions, um, uh, I have complete liberty in that sense. According to Hobbes, right? There are no artificial chains binding me. So this is how Locke defines the liberty of the subject. And for this, I'm going ahead to chapter six, which we haven't read yet, but um, section 57. For in all states of created beings capable of laws, where there is no law, there is no freedom. For liberty is to be free from restraint and violence from others, which cannot be where there is no law. So we're still talking about like metaphorical chains or walls that are metaphorically holding someone back. But now we're not focusing on me, but on everyone else. So, like, um, so right. So, like, according to Hobbes, we leave the state of late nature by laying down some of these unlimited rights. We reciprocally lay them down, whatever. Um, so, after we leave the state of nature, we each have only these bounded rights left. That is all the subjects to. The sovereign, of course, according to Hobbes, is still in the state of nature and still has the original unlimited right. So here's the sovereign, still has rights. But the subjects have all of these limited rights now. Um, and Hobbes says this is like a metaphorical wall that's restraining them. But within the wall, they still have liberty. Whereas Locke is saying, what is liberty? Again, in the metaphorical sense, liberty means some law is keeping everyone else out of my sphere. Right, so it's still like a metaphorical wall around me or metaphorical chains constraining something, but the people who are being constrained are everyone else. They're not allowed to interfere in my sphere. So um, in Hobbes' state of nature, there's, there's as much of Hobbes' liberty as you could want, but there's none of Locke's liberty, right? In Hobbes' state of nature, I have the right to everything, but so does everyone else. So there's no sphere, no matter how small, not even my own body, in which I have the right to do things without interference. And moreover, even in Hobbes' commonwealth, there's no sphere like that. Right, because even though the other subjects now don't have a right to interfere in my property, the sovereign still does. I have no property rights against the sovereign. So according to, to Locke's definition of liberty, there's no liberty 
no political liberty anywhere in Hobbes system. Whereas of course, what Locke calls liberty is impossible according to Hobbes. Right, because according to Hobbes in the state of nature, there's no such liberty. There can't be because everyone has an unlimited right. And when we leave the state of nature, we can only do that by setting up an absolute, absolute sovereign. And in setting up the absolute sovereign, we limit our rights, but not their right. So there's no way to ever create this sphere of what Locke calls liberty, according to Hobbes. Um, and I think you can probably anticipate this difference about what kind of right and liberty I have in the state of nature is going to make a big difference into what, on, uh, with respect to what, um, how we're going to leave the state of nature. Both because, um, we're coming in with an inalienable right. Hobbes and Locke agree about that, but they just don't agree what it is. Um, according to Locke, it's gonna be that I can't ever give up having this, voluntarily give up having this sphere of liberty. That would be tantamount to giving someone the power to kill me. Um, but also because since the states of nature are different, um, the reason we want to leave the state of nature is gonna be different. So both like what things are available to address it because like what rights I can, I can give up and what rights I can't give up are different, but also um, like my motives are different. Um, Something that might look a good, like a good deal in Hobbes state of nature will look like a bad deal in Locke's state of nature. Okay. Um, I think that's actually the most important. I think I just right now cover the most important points. Um, actually, maybe I should read one thing because I'm not sure I'm gonna get to it. And then I'm going to go on this somewhat secondary question, although it's pretty important in the end about who is the executive. Um, But I just wanted to read that. I mean, I said this, but I just wanted to show in the text where Locke says it. This is um, chapter three, section 16 on page 14. Um, And hence it is that he who attempts to get another man into his absolute power does thereby put himself into a state of war with him. It, it being to be understood as a declaration of a design upon his life. For I have reason to conclude that he who would get me into his power without my consent would use me as he pleased when he had got me there and destroy me too when he had a fancy to it. For nobody can desire to have me in his absolute power unless it be to build. This isn't exactly the part I wanted to read, is it? This isn't the part I wanted to read, although it's important, but actually, this is the part I wanted to read. For a man not having power of his own life, 
cannot by a compact or his own consent enslave himself to anyone, nor put himself under the absolute arbitrary power of another to take away his life when he pleases. Nobody can give more power than he has himself, right? So again, Locke concludes that um, um, I, like, I, I literally can't um, voluntarily put myself into someone else's power because um, the law of nature like that restrains me from destroying myself um, doesn't allow me to give someone else that kind of power over me. I don't have that kind of power to begin with. I don't, so I can't give it to someone else. <laughs> is another way of looking at it, um, right? So like, so the covenant that starts Hobbes Commonwealth, whether by acquisition or by institution is gonna be invalid according to Locke, right? Like the parties agreed to something that they had no power to agree to. Okay, so oh, now I see there's only two minutes left. Oh, well, like I said, I did get to the important part. Um, the other thing is important too, and especially when you get to, well, here, I'll just try to say it quickly. Um, or maybe I should talk about it at the beginning next time. I'll say it quickly and then see if I can find time for it at the beginning next time. So like in the essay, it seems like the answer is that, the, that God is the executive of the law of nature and the state of nature. So the reasoning by which all rational creatures can conclude that the law of nature applies to them, that is that it's attached to rewards and punishments that outweigh their other incentives, is reasoning by which they can prove to themselves that God exists and will reward or punish um, based on this law. And, uh, you know, how do we know that God will enforce this law? This, is, this has to be accessible simply by reason to all rational creatures, right? You can't appeal to revelation for this. So, I mean, it seems like the answer is something like, God evidently wills the, what's best for society, not for any particular individual, right? As like Locke said, beings are, are evidently of one uh, equal species and rank, all rational beings. I take it that means. So, um, so we can assume that he wants me to do what's for the public good, not for what's my own private good. And that's basically the law of nature. Um, in the treatise, on the other hand, although there are these theological comments here and there, for the most part, it's clear that the executive in the law of nature is everyone. Everyone has a right to reward or punish violations of the law of nature in the state of nature. So like, if we're all in the state of nature and I say, see someone take one of your possessions, then um, I'm allowed to, and maybe I'm supposed to, that's not quite so clear, but I'm certainly allowed to punish the thief. Now the thief's allowed to punish me too, <laughs> right? So there's gonna be inconvenience here. If people start to disagree as people will about, what is the law of nature? Who's violated it, et cetera. But, um, but at least in theory, you know, if everyone says the thief's taking your possessions, then uh, I think Locke believes that everyone around will um, gang up against the thief. And that's what's gonna make a, sufficiently reliable enforcement of the law of nature that we can say it applies in the state of nature. So those answers obviously are quite different, whether we're relying on God or in the afterlife or relying on people 
round about us using their reason. Um, and they might have really different implications in certain, you know, cases that are a little bit different than the ones that Locke is usually thinking about. But the last thing I want to say is that um, it's um, absolutely clear that um, on either of those ways of looking at it, it can't be that the slaves in Carolina don't have these rights. Um, because to have these rights, they have to be rational creatures. How rational? Well, so on the treatise view, they have to be rational enough to understand reward and punishment. But I mean, you can't be a slave. Now, I mean, Hobbes uses slave strictly to mean people who are actually in chains, but Locke doesn't, obviously not in the Constitutions of Carolina and not in um, the treatise either. So you can't be a slave in this sense, namely someone who's kept in subjection by fear, unless you understand reward and punishment. And on the other hand, the passage in the Constitutions of Carolina, the only place he mentions the absolute power of the settlers over their Negro slaves, as he puts it, is in the context of discussion of religious freedom. And he's saying it's the context is he's saying the slaves also have a right to join whatever church they want, but even if they become Christians, it won't free them from slavery. That's basically the like the structure of that section or like the, the reason for that comment at the end. Well, obviously, you can't give religious freedom to people who aren't capable of following proofs of the existence of God and the afterlife and stuff like that. Right, so by that standard also, they're rational enough. And so, I'm sorry, I've gone four minutes over. I'll just conclude by saying there's, you know, there's a complete contradiction between what Locke says there in the Fundamental Constitutions of Carolina and his view in the essay and the treatise. And like I said, maybe I'll say more about this next time. Next time is tomorrow <laughs> in person and hopefully I'll see you then, bye.